Hi, my name is Lisa Garvin, and I'm interviewing two professors who are doing research into a fatal feline disease. My guests today are Dr. Julian Leibowitz, who is a professor of veterinary pathobiology at Texas A&M University, and Dr. Paul DeFigurado, who is an associate professor in the same department. Let's talk about FIP, or feline infectious peritonitis. Dr. Leibowitz, what is FIP? So FIP is a disease caused by a virus, uh, not very originally named, feline infectious peritonitis virus. It's a member of the coronavirus family and is very closely related to a benign virus of cats, a feline enteric coronavirus. And in fact, uh, FIP is a derivative from, uh, of those viruses that you know, are widespread in nature and infect cats predominantly when they're young. And it's, is, it a, is it a genetic mm. mutation of FECV? Yes, it's a series, uh, it's probably more than one mutation, although uh, one or two mutations have been mapped in different genes, by the way, that uh, seem to arise during the infection with FECV. Now, is this a prevalent disease, or is it something that's still increasing in the cat population? It's been with us for a long time, but it's fairly common. Uh, almost all cats are infected by feline uh, enteric coronavirus by the time they're a year or two old. So the virus is widely circulating. Uh, fortunately, not all cats develop FIP because it's a devastating disease. Now, Dr. Figueroa, um, is, is this, there's no cure for FIP at this point, is there? No, that's correct. It really is a disease if the animal uh, succumbs, it, it's lethal. What, how does it manifest and at what age does it manifest? So cats under one year, most commonly, or very old cats may also come down with it, um, probably because they never completely cleared their infection or they're reinfected as their immune system wanes when they get older. And young cats that are unable to clear the virus uh, when they're infected as, uh, under a year. What are the symptoms? Are there any symptoms that are obvious? Well, there are two forms of the disease. Uh, one is called the wet form, and one is called the dry form. And I'll tell you that I'm not a veterinarian, so my, my clinical knowledge of how the disease presents is imperfect. But they present with abdominal swelling most common, and they accumulate fluid in their chest cavity and in their abdomen. And the, uh, the, that's really the inflammation that accompanies that is what does them in, and that's the wet form. In the dry form, they often have uh, central nervous system lesions in the brain or cardiac lesions, and uh, that also, those lesions are also fatal, and they're, they're all the lesions are inflammatory in nature. How fast does it progress? Um, over months, I would say, weeks to months. Oh, so it's not like a quick progression, it's like not a couple a, of weeks. It's not, you know, a really rapid disease. So FIP is similar to some human diseases because they're all in the same disease family of coronaviruses. Uh, that's correct. Um, the best known human coronavirus infections are SARS and MERS, the Middle Eastern uh, Respiratory Syndrome virus. So Dr. Figueroa, in your research, perhaps what you're finding out about FIP will also help with these human diseases as well? Uh, that's correct. I think that um, one of the real challenges is to figure out strategies that one can attack, can use to attack these viruses for which uh, interventions are unavailable. And to do that, I think we really have to think outside of the box and start to use strategies that have never been used before. And our approach is really quite interesting insofar as we collaborate closely with engineers, uh, electrical engineers, in fact, who have expertise in making 
silicon chips and other small chips that you might commonly associate with uh, a computer functionality or one that's in your cell phone. But these chips have been derivatized to actually carry out biological reactions. And our goal is to develop chips that can be used to develop novel therapeutics to interdict uh, coronaviruses. Why are we starting with a feline version of the disease as opposed to a human version? Well, the feline provides a very uh, important biological question, uh, an important disease for animals, of course, and we have strong veterinary interests. In addition, um, it turns out that it's a pretty tractable system experimentally for us to use. So that if we can tackle the feline question, we can not only address an important animal disease question, but also issue, but also uh, uh, advanced other human diseases as well. So is the end game a vaccine? Because that's typically what you use to fight a virus, but we're also talking about a genetic mutation here. So the end game is uh, twofold, I think. Um, in the shorter term, we want to develop therapeutics that we can deliver to the animals that are uh, suffering. And those therapeutics then uh, will have immediate clinical impact. But importantly, uh, the same technology that can develop the ther therapeutics will inform vaccine development. That's a longer term strategy. Vaccine development turns out to be a very challenging uh, and expensive uh, uh, thing to achieve. Uh, but what we like about our approach is that we have a staged, a staged strategy that perhaps will enable both ultimately to be realized. Tell me a little bit more about these chips. Are they implanted into the cats? That's a great question. So these are actually not implantables. They're uh, devices that are used to uh, discover therapeutics. So it's stuff that's used strictly, these are chips that are used strictly in the laboratory by, sci by a scientist with significant expertise in the biological system and how these uh, chips work. But what they do, which is really quite remarkable, is that they are able to um, transpose uh, experiments that usually take, that would otherwise take thousands or tens of thousands of test tubes and hundreds of workers uh, to, to transpose that into a, uh, a nano scale or micro scale uh, experimental system that where a single investigator working rapidly uh, can get results. And so that's, that's the real big advantage is mini miniaturization uh, and throughput, uh, which ultimately lowers costs and uh, leads to the achievement of, we hope, um, promising therapeutics uh, more quickly. And at what stage are you in your research right now? Really an early stage. Um, this, is a, this is really new, a new frontier for us. We're really excited about it, but it's an early stage. We've uh, spent about uh, 10 years in collaboration with Dr. Arum Han, who's an expert in electrical engineering uh, and the microfluidic aspects of the chip about 10 years uh, working with these systems to develop some of the key functionalities, but we have yet to apply them to FIP, and that uh, constitutes our next frontier. Now, do you go straight to cat models, or do you start in, like, mouse models, or, I mean, how does that progress? We're very stingy about our, um, when we think about applying our technology to animals, because we are uh, extremely concerned and conscientious about the humane treatment of animals. Um, so our goal is to, diverse, to diverse develop the technology in vitro, just using uh, cell culture models. These are cells that are immortalized and that can grow forever uh, in dishes. And then we will uh, take our most prom promising candidates and most promising approaches and then move those to murine models, to mouse models. And only then, when we have proof of concept, will we think about moving to a uh, clinical trial with, uh, with uh, companion animals. And Dr. Leibowitz, is it your hope that this disease can either be A, eradicated, or B, made not fatal? Well, our hope is that uh, with our efforts, uh, combined with some efforts from other investigators who were working in a more traditional uh, drug development mode, because it will probably take combined therapy, we will be able to produce uh, another arm that will allow us to treat cats and it, at the very least, keep the disease from progressing further or to completely block the disease. It may even be possible from the knowledge that we can gain because of the high throughput, uh, we can determine 
how to produce an effective vaccine. And that's sort of the gold standard. And we won't know whether we can do that until we're really far along. Is, is it contagious or is it just a mutation? It's contagious in that the virus that evolves, although it's not excreted at high levels, um, can infect other cats, and it's already mutated to produce FIP. So um, you can have outbreaks of FIP in a cattery. As you said, Dr. Figueroa, that, you know, vaccine research is very expensive and vaccine development. How do you propose to raise funds for your research? How are you going about that? That's a, that's a good question. I think we're, we, have, um, we have a multi-pronged approach. Um, we're really excited about uh, securing uh, private investment, investment from donors at the early stage. Uh, moving beyond that, there are uh, both state and federal resources that we can uh, use to, uh, to advance the research. And I think that what really helps is just having preliminary data that can support every stage of the development uh, process. I think it's conceivable, if we have success down the road, that uh, commercialization also constitutes a, a way to bring in resources to develop a vaccine and or therapeutic and or vaccine. And of course, you know, pets are a multi-billion dollar business in, in the United States. So, I mean, as we see pets as companions rather than pets, it seems like the concern is there and, and, the, and the, the, you know, the desire to get a vaccine. That's right. And, we're, and we hope that uh, our research resonates with pet owners, with cat owners as well. So previous efforts to find a cure for FIP have fallen somewhat short, I guess. And that's absolutely correct. Um, there is a vaccine, actually. The problem is it doesn't work very well. The difficulty is that coronaviruses are RNA viruses. And like most RNA viruses, they have a very high mutation rate. So they're able to escape. Um, the antibodies, um, the majority of the antibodies that are elicited the other difficulty is that antibodies that don't neutralize infection can produce enhancement and actually worsen disease. So the goal is to find um, antibodies that will neutralize and not enhance. And that's the needle in a haystack. You, you really have to sort through a lot of cells that are producing antibodies. And doing that manually is a gargantuan task. And this technology uh, is a really big magnet, so it will help you find the needle in the haystack. So uh, what's the next step for you two? And you also have a third person very involved in this research. So w right now we're doing a small number of experiments uh, with a related mouse virus to uh, sort of get the ball rolling a little bit. And then we would like to do some in vitro experiments uh, where we're using the technology and start moving into doing that with um, FIPV as well. And in terms of uh the third person, it's Dr. Arum Han. He's a professor of electrical engineering, electrical and computer engineering at Texas A&M University. And he is the expert in the actual chip development. And he's developed a wide variety of chips that address all kinds of questions uh, outside of infectious disease. He's got chips that uh, are advancing uh, efforts to develop novel biofuels. He's developed chips that are really good at uh, interrogating the neural system and neural development. And so we're really fortunate to have him lend his expertise to this viral project. Um, and his goal is to develop a unique chip that is perfectly suited for this hunt for the needle in the haystack. Uh, we call that chip prescient. And we call it that because our hope is that with Dr. Han's chip working with us, that it can, pr it can see the future. It can see the future uh, in a prescient way of, you know, a therapeutic or the vaccine that we ultimately hope to achieve. All righty, great. Thank you both very much, and good luck with your research. Well, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank Thanks. you very much for doing this. 
As we heard, this FIP research is in the beginning stages and needs funding to get off the ground. Now let's find out about a clever fundraising effort in the works called Angel Wings and Furry Things. Part of this fundraising effort is being led by a cat about town who we call Cleo the Cat. She's very well known in some parts of Montrose and Houston for her fundraising efforts and also her costumes. Her owner, Deborah Thomas, is going to tell us more about Cleo. So what is Cleo doing this time? Well, this year, Cleo is doing something really exciting and different. She's since 2008, she has been helping animal causes and um, she, she was adopted from Harris County Animal Control and so it's always been her passion to help animals but this year she's also going to be helping with breast cancer and her grandmother is a breast cancer survivor and you know I, I work there at MD Anderson so she's helping a group called Harley's Angels and then also she's helping A&M raise funds for uh, FIP. So FIP is feline infectious peritonitis. Why is that so important to Cleo? Well, a lot of animals have died from that. Or cats particularly is a very, uh, very contagious condition. And once animals get it, once cats get it, it's pretty much over for them. They did have a vaccine for it, but they found that didn't work. And also this is something that can help once they get a cure for this, it can also help in other areas for other animals and also human beings. Cleo's mom mentioned that Cleo is not only helping her animal charity of choice this year, but also raising funds for breast cancer research through Harley's Angels. Let's find out more about this side of the fundraiser. Um, I'm talking with Cindy Cheney, who is an MD Anderson employee and also a member of Harley's Angels. Tell me what that group's all about. Well, Harley's Angels is a group of women motorcycle riders and enthusiasts who have come together to raise funds for breast cancer research and uh, prevention. We've been around since 2003, and we donate all of our funds to MD Anderson and Baylor's breast cancer programs. And I understand you've raised quite a bit of money in these few years to help with breast cancer research. Yeah, so far we've raised over $700,000, and we are planning to donate another 60000 next month. And how do you raise your money? Do you go on rides, or how do you do that? Various ways. We raise funds at different events. Uh, in the past, we've kind of uh, piggybacked on any kind of event that would give us free booth space, that would donate booth space. And we take donations for our annual calendar that we produce and other Harley's Angels memorabilia. Well, what is it about breast cancer? Why, why is that the focus of your fundraising efforts? Mainly because our founding members, uh, of which one was a breast cancer survivor. So it started with the Ladies of Hog chapter here in Houston, and it morphed into Harley's Angels because one of them was a breast cancer survivor. Why are you joining with Cleo the Cat and her push for FIP? My coworker at recently joined Harley's Angels and told me about her fundraising efforts with Cleo, and we just thought it might be a good opportunity to expand our reach, both Cleo's and Harley's Angels, to a new audience. Angel Wings and Furry Things is Sunday, October 18th, from 2 to 6 p.m. at Rudyard's English Pub in Houston, Texas. The Irish rock band Blaggards will be performing live. For tickets, or if you would like to donate to the cause, please visit theharleysangels.org or cleocleocat.com. Thank you for listening.